What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, and as you may have noticed in the thumbnail, your boy took it on the chin this week. Welcome to week seven of my weekly CFL football pick show for the 2024 CFL season, and look, we gotta prove yet again that we got a jaw and we can take a punch. We definitely can, and uh, boy, we're gonna have to <laughs> after last week. It was not a good week for yours truly. Three and nine after it really felt like we took a step forward uh, after the previous week uh, we come right back down to earth with our worst week of the season at three and nine only one and three across the board straight up against the spread and over under we had a number of upsets last week the whole league went over last week so it just was not a good week 14 and 10 straight up 11 and 13 against the spread and 10 and 14 on the totals means i'm back to two games under 500 on the season at 35 and 37. I've had worse weeks, not many of them, but I've had worse weeks. This will be the worst week that we have this season. I'm putting that on paper right now. That is my commitment to you. This past week will be the worst week I have all year. You also may notice uh, your boy's a little bubbly today, uh, a little sweaty. Uh, we're still in the middle of a uh, a pretty substantial little heat wave here in Nova Scotia, so it's a little warm today. I'm 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 a little moist, but uh, we will persevere. Had another fairly solid week in CFL Fantasy in week six, brought in nearly 106 points. And it's, you know, it was under top 2,500 across the whole game and just inside the top 300 in Derek Taylor's league. But it's, it's consistency. It's consistent week in, week out, 100 points, basically without fail. I think I've had one week this season that was like not competitive with 100 points. So 670 points on the season. It's just uh, outside the top 2250 across the game and just inside the top 300 in Derek Taylor's league. Obviously, I want to be striving for more here. Obviously, there's a lot more points on the table that are available to be had, but Still a strong week at 105.9. Vernon Adams was my MOP from last week. 27.9 points with the two times captain multiplier. So he was up over 55. Our four game slate in the CFL in week seven looks like this. The Edmonton Elks and the Ottawa Red Blacks rematch to begin the week. A very quick turnaround and obviously some very big news coming out of Edmonton in that game. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers are in Saskatchewan taking on the Riders. Winnipeg still waiting to take their first bye week of the season. The Toronto Argos enter their third consecutive road game, this time in Hamilton taking on the Tie Cats. And the BC Lions, also waiting for their first bye of the season, are in in Calgary taking on the Stampeders. Montreal, luckily for them, after suffering, you know, the injury to Fajardo, the injury to Kyan Julian Grant, they are off this week. And like I mentioned right off the top, the whole league went over last week. 4-0 and oh to the over last week, a 7-1 and one run to the over league-wide across the last two weeks. And last week, look, two straight-up upsets and the against the spread underdogs on a wild eight and four against the spread run. You'd be eight and four against the spread if you just took the points in every game over the last three weeks. And before we get into the game previews, I will let you know there will be no CFL fantasy roster on this episode yet again. The game still has not unlocked for week seven. It inevitably will while I'm recording this episode, but as of right now, it has not unlocked. So I will have that roster for you in the comments down below. Obviously, I've done a bunch of prep work, but it's going to depend on what costs are. That roster, again, will be in the pinned comment down below once I can get it out there. All right, so as I said, the Edmonton Elks and the Ottawa Red Blacks are going to be rematching from last week. This time that game is in Ottawa. And look, on Edmonton's side of things, another heartbreaking collapse in literally the dying seconds of the game, the final 10 seconds of the game. Like, Edmonton ties the game, and somehow you brought in Boris Beattie to fix the kicking problems, and with eight seconds left, he tries this weird squib kick thing that goes 60 yards and then goes out of bounds. So a kickoff out of bounds, plus allowing a 29-yard completion right on the tail end of that, puts Ottawa in field goal range. Lewis Ward hits the game-winning field goal, and that costs Chris Jones his job. I literally published a video last night where I talked for, you know, three minutes or so about the dismissal of Chris Jones, what it could possibly mean for the Elks, who's taking over at head coach and GM. 
go check out that video. Like I say, it's only three minutes long. A lot of people already have the viewership on that video was actually pretty good overnight. So go check that out. But uh, I talk about that a little more in depth there. In terms of the here and now, what that means for the Elks is they are a complete wild card heading into this week with a new head coach. Like, what kind of a game plan can you even install in four days? You know what I mean? Like, it's it's going to be a very tall task for Jarius Jackson to install any kind of complexity in a game plan. I think we see a very simple, probably short playbook for the Edmonton Elks coming into the game this week, which could serve them well. Like, look, this can serve as the hard reset for your season. You're zero and zero from this point. And I understand that, like, at zero and five, it seems baffling to talk about it. The playoffs are not out of this conversation. All you have to do as a Western team to make the playoffs is not finish last in the division and be better than Hamilton and Ottawa. Like, that's all you need to do. The crossover spot is still on the table here. There is an infrastructure to build on here. The Elks, over their last four games, are number four in the CFL in both offensive and and defensive efficiency. There is an infrastructure to build on here. Just the decision making of the one guy at the top that like just screwed this team. It felt like forevermore, but they were finally able to now move that vision out, bring a new vision in. And is it finally Trey Ford time? On Ottawa's side of things in that game last week, Drew Brown absolutely dominates this game. 68% completion on his passes, 480 passing yards for Drew Brown and a pair of passing touchdowns. He did also throw a pick, but he had three receivers go over 100 yards, including shout-out Khalil Pimpleton. Four catches, a buck 53 receiving, and a receiving touchdown. I believe that was his CFL debut. Uh, heck of a game, young man. We, we appreciate that big time. But it was still just enough to beat the Edmonton Elks, still with Chris Jones. The fact that the Red Blacks went 64% on second down did overshadow a pair of turnovers that they had on the offensive side, as well as taking eight penalties for 100 penalty yards. And they still needed all five of those Lewis Ward field goals. The Ottawa Red Blacks are the single worst, least efficient offense in the CFL over their last four games. This is not a cakewalk for either one of these teams. As we mentioned, there are so many unanswerable questions with the Elks this week until we actually see it on the field. But we know who the Red Blacks are. We know who this team is. This team is, like I said, the least efficient offense in the CFL. Defensively, they're number seven in terms of defensive efficiency in a league where defensive efficiency has cratered over the last few weeks. It, it, the offenses have taken over. It is very firmly hashtag over season. Have I taken all four overs this week? I haven't, but league wide defensive efficiency is down and Ottawa is still like the third worst in the league. So we know what the red blacks are. The questions are with Edmonton just kind of feels like take the points is in session. So I'm going to take the Edmonton Elks on the road in Ottawa, short playbook, simple game plan, hard reset, Elks in Ottawa, upset the Red Blacks. And it is an upset because Ottawa is a marginal favorite here at home at minus two and a half. I like Edmonton to win, so I'll take the plus on those points. Total in the game set at 53, and it is the biggest total of the week. I am going to go under on this total because, again, I don't trust really that Ottawa's offense will have that kind of performance two weeks in a row. I don't expect Drew Brown to go for nearly 500 passing yards again. And, again, we don't know what we're going to get out of the Elks on the offensive side. Hopefully, again, it's a new vision. It's a new game plan. It's a new game script. Hopefully, we see all of those things. But I am going to stick under here because I have been impressed lately with Edmonton's efficiency on defense. Like, the sexy numbers do not look good. But the efficiency does. So, we're going to stick under here. Go 27-21 to 21 in favor of the Edmonton Elks. Elks win. Elks cover the plus 2.5. And, and give me the under on the 53-point total. 
Let's go to Saskatchewan now where the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are in town. The Bombers winning a slugfest last week against the Calgary Stampeders after coughing up a 10-point lead in that game. They kind of looked like they were on cruise control and then it turned into, you know, it got into the championship rounds in that game. But Winnipeg held on. Winnipeg got the win. It was something of a tepid return for Zach Kalaros, who did complete 75% of his passes for 344 yards, but threw two touchdowns, had two picks as well. And as it turns out, I, I, I kind of took a victory lap about this on Twitter. We'll give myself a little Barry Horowitz there. Uh, I was two weeks early on hashtag Ontario Wilson season, because <laughs> I said that like coming out of week four. I think right around the time when Schoen got injured, I was like, oh, it's it's Ontario Wilson season. Let's go. Um, I was two weeks early, but uh, turns out it is Ontario Wilson season, in fact. 13 catches for 201 yards receiving and a receiving touchdown. Hey, we're here now. It's very firmly hashtag Ontario Wilson season. The Bombers now number two in league-wide efficiency. That's a combination of offense and defense. League-wide I would power rank the Winnipeg Blue Bombers from an efficiency perspective, number two in the league over the last four games. Kind of feels like they might be back. In Saskatchewan, it was not uh, very pretty last week. They spotted the BC Lions the first 10 points of the game, as well as the final 13 points of the game in what was a relatively flat effort, especially again at the beginning and at the end, whether it's how you start or how you finish, Saskia was not good on either hand. Shea Patterson, in his two starts now as a rider starting quarterback, 470 passing yards, it's not too bad. Only one passing touchdown. He has thrown a pick. He has added a rush touchdown. He's been okay. He's been fine. He, you Maybe you could even argue that he's been good. Certainly hasn't been great. Shout out to AJ Willette finding pay dirt twice in that game last week for his second and third rushing touchdowns of the season, but still is not part of the pass game. He's only caught two passes over his last two games. He did have a couple of games there where I think he had three or four catches apiece in those games, but has gone right back to being a non-factor in the pass game since Shea Patterson has taken over. The are still number one are the Riders in efficiency across the board, but this type of game for the Riders are the scary kinds of games. The scary kind of game that the defense can't win for you. The defense was not going to beat the Lions. It had to be, the offense had to keep pace, and they kind of showed that they couldn't. So these are the scary games for the Riders until Trevor Harris can come back, the games that the defense can't win for them. I'm not 100% sure whether this is a game this week that fits that definition like Winnipeg offensively they've certainly come a long way from where they were at the beginning of the year my god through the first couple weeks of the season I think their efficiency was like dead last in the league on offense now it's about middle of the pack at about 13.3 it might be one of those games but again like this Riders defense has been pretty good but I do note, like pretty well the entirety of the rest of the league, their defense is not as good from an efficiency perspective as it was a few weeks ago as the offenses have taken over. I think I got to take Winnipeg's offense in this one. I think, with, especially with Zach Kalaros back, and now that he's got some of the rust kind of uh, brushed off of him from his injury, from his thorax injury earlier, I think I got to take the Bombers here, even though, again, fatigue is going to have to start setting in here as well as they're still waiting for a bye week. But give me the Winnipeg Blue Bombers on the road in Saskatchewan to beat the Riders. On the line, the Riders are taking plus two here as a marginal home dog. I like Winnipeg to win. Minus two is a very small price to pay. So let's lay the two points on Winnipeg. Total in the game set at 50 and a half points. I do think this goes over. I think it kind of follows along the league wide trend. Uh, let's go over the 50 and a half point total here in Winnipeg Saski. I'm going to go like a 32 21, something like that. So bombers win, bombers cover minus two and give me the over on the points. Up next, we have the Toronto Argos, as I said earlier off the top of the show, on their third straight road game, not back to backs, back to back to back road games for the Toronto Argos. They dropped 37 points on Montreal last week, which included a Winton McManus pick six, a Janarian Grant kick return touchdown, and over 37 and a half minutes possessing the football on the offensive side. 
Cameron Dukes, despite all that possession, only putting up 177 all-purpose yards, not passing yards, all-purpose yards. He added in a pass touchdown, and of course, they were the beneficiary of the injury to Cody Fajardo fairly early in that game for the Alouettes. They were also, again, had an injury to Kyan Julian Grant. So it's always next man up, and I'm never going to make excuses for teams. But Toronto was set up to succeed in that game, but they definitely executed and they did so. However, I sit here thinking about the Toronto Argos, and the term comes to mind, glass cannon. The Argos offensive efficiency currently sits at 11.9 over their last four games. So it only takes them 11.9 yards to put a point on the scoreboard on average in their last four games. That is number two across the CFL. Second only to da -da 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 -da, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, interestingly enough. However, on the defensive efficiency side, that same metric, how many yards it takes to put a point on the board against the Argos is 11.3. That is dead last in the CFL over the last four games. And what that means is it takes fewer yards to score a point against the Argos than it does for the Argos to score a point. You want the opposite of that. <laughs> You want it to be super easy for your offense to score and super difficult for the other offenses to score. So this is a glass cannon. This is a team that can put up 30, but they're probably going to give up 35. On Hamilton's side of things, the Ticats exit their bye winless at 0-5 on the season, allowing a league-worst 169 points in total in those five games. And this is just their second game against the East Division this season off of their two-point loss in Ottawa in Week 4. So the rest of their season, their other four games, have all been against the West. I'm not going to mince words. There's not a ton of reason for optimism for the Thai Cats, like looking at the team where they sit right now, Bo Levi Mitchell is having a good season. Like he's not having a bad year. You can't, I still don't think you can hang the results this season on Bo. The defense isn't stopping anybody. So, I mean, like when you're giving up, what is that? That's 30, th almost 34 points a game. It's, it's fait accompli. You can't, your defense can't be that bad and expect to win games. Bo Levi Mitchell is not having a bad year. And their offense is certainly improving. When you look at the efficiency um, statistic here, they are 15.3 over their last four games. So 15 and a third, basically, yards to put a point on the board. Through week four, they were at 16.6. .6. So the offense is trending in the right direction. They're being more efficient with the football on the offensive side. Again, still the second worst mark league-wide in this metric, but it is showing steady improvement. And really, the, the key to this offense is James Butler. You have to get James Butler going. In four games, he's carried the ball 39 times for 183 scoreless yards on the ground. When James Butler explodes, this Ticats offense is going to explode as well. That is definitely in the realm of possibility. They're in the, in the, in the spectrum of outcomes here in this game. James Butler exploding for like a pair of touchdowns and 150 all purpose yards is totally on the board. 100%. It's not like the Argos. The Argos are not a juggernaut right now. I would put the Argos like middle of the pack in terms of like their offensive efficiency. Again, really good. Their defense abysmal. So given that, even though I do think the Argos are the better team, I'm going to take the Hamilton Tiger Cats to win this game outright. The reason for that being a massive rest advantage. They're coming off the bye. They're at home. The Argos are on their third consecutive road game. They've been on the road for three weeks now. So if not now, when? For the Hamilton Tiger Cats. I think Bo Levi Mitchell has a big game. I think those receivers who are you know, playing well this year. You're looking at like Keandre Smith as well as uh, Shamar Bridges. They're playing very well. They're a pair of the top receivers in the CFL statistically so far this year. I think the Hamilton Ticats get it done this week. Give me Hamilton at home to beat and upset the Toronto Argos. And it's a pretty sizable upset here. Hamilton is taking plus five as a home dog. 
I think either way you see this game going, I think you take those five points. Plus five is 100% the play in this game. Total in this game set at 52. I do think it's going to go over. I think Hamilton has gone over four of their five games this season. Like This is going to be a defensive crapshoot. And I think it's going to come right down to the end of the game. And I think Bo Levi Mitchell leads a game-winning drive for the Hamilton Ticats to win this game 28-27. to They pull it out right at the end. Hamilton stuns the Toronto Argos. Hamilton wins. Give me plus five on the Ticats and give me the over on the 52-point total. And the last game of the week sees the BC Lions on the road in Calgary to take on the Stampeders. The Lions, as we mentioned a little earlier, start and finish strong last week in a two-possession win over the Riders. The first 10 points of the game, the final 13 of the game. Vernon Adams, only one touchdown and two picks in the pass game last week, but put up 451 yards passing. His first 450-yard game of the season, his first 400-yard game of the season, I believe it was, and he added a rush touchdown. Is there any argument at this point that Vernon Adams is like the runaway favorite for most outstanding player. When it comes to the BC Lions on the offensive side, I will still make the argument that they are a prolific offense, but that being a prolific offense does not necessarily mean that this offense is great. Yes, they are prolific. Yes, they move the ball a lot. Yes, they score a lot of points, but they are still number seven in the CFL in offensive efficiency. There is a lot of waste A lot of wasted movement in this BC Lions offense. It's long drives that wind up in field goals, but they're still like, they're moving the ball at an exceptional rate. It just doesn't always reflect on the scoreboard how well they're moving the ball. But based on attrition, basically, based on the rest of the league doing this and BC kind of still staying here, on the defensive efficiency side of the ball, they're now the number one most efficient defense in the CFL. Trust me, this is not the best defense in the CFL, but based on like everybody else doing this, BC currently stands just barely right at the top of that defensive efficiency metric. And it makes them a very tough out week in and week out. It's not always about the sexy stats, unless you're looking at Justin McInnes. (laughs) His last two games, 24 catches. 387 yards receiving and three touchdowns. Madden on rookie numbers. Justin McInnes is on fire. The single hottest offensive player in the CFL. In Calgary, the Stampeders cover as an against the spread dog for the third straight game. Certainly worth keeping an eye on from a spread perspective. But they fall short in Winnipeg, as we mentioned Previously, this was Jake Mayer's fourth consecutive game throwing at least one interception. And over those four games, the touchdown to interception ratio is only six to five. Looks a lot similar to what he wound up finishing last year with, which is, I believe, like 19 and 14, I want to say the touchdown to interception ratio was somewhere in there. But he's still showing improvements over 2023. He's completing a ton more passes than he was last year. Part of the problem and what makes Calgary such a difficult play right now is other than Montreal, no other team in the CFL has seen as much of a defensive efficiency free fall as the Calgary Stampeders. So Montreal started the first couple of weeks of the season. Their defensive efficiency number was at 21. Crazy. But as it sits right now over their last four games, Montreal is at a 12.7. So that's a free fall. So other than Montreal, no team has free-fallen more than Calgary. Calgary started the season 16.6. After week four, they were at 16.4, about the same. They currently sit at 13.7, which means it's a lot easier to score points on the Calgary Stampeders defense in their last four games than it was earlier in the season. A middling offense cannot sustain an inefficient defense. But shout out to Diedrich Mills, who has touched the ball at least, I think, 11 times in the run game in all four of his games. That's a way the Stampeders can kind of keep games lower scoring, keep it tighter, really using that run game. I think they're like the number two run offense in the CFL right now. Part of the problem with that is they're up against a BC Lions team that has excelled at defending the run this season. I think they're still like the number two statistical run defense in the CFL, even though 
BC is like Winnipeg still waiting to get their first buy. And like Montreal, again, Montreal fell flat leading into their bye week. Uh, I can't remember right off the top of my head whether Winnipeg is on bye next week or whether BC is on bye. I didn't look at the schedule. But um, the possibility here definitely exists that Calgary wins this game outright. I just think BC is the better football team right now. Certainly more prolific uh, on the offensive side. We're going to lean on that and take the BC Lions on the road in Calgary to beat the Stamps. Uh, on the line, Calgary's taking plus 4.5 against the spread. But again, where BC's sexy numbers do look so good, I think I got to lay four and a half points on them. Under a touchdown, even though it's on the road, I do think I got to lay four and a half. So minus four and a half on the BC Lions is what I'm going to take. Total in this game is set at 52 and a half. I am actually going to stay under on this. I don't think this game gets into the 50s. Uh, I do think both teams get to 20. But I don't think the game gets into the 50. So it's it's a pretty marginal under, but I'm going to take the under on this one. Under 52 and a half points in BC Calgary. Let's go 28 to 20 in favor of the Lions. Lions win. Lions cover minus four and a half and give me the under on the points. So again, since we don't have a fantasy roster to give you, those are my picks for week seven in the CFL. We'll give them to you here one more time. I've got the Edmonton Elks upsetting the Ottawa Red Blacks 27 to 21. Edmonton wins, covers plus two and a half, and stays under the 53 point total. I got the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in Saskatchewan beating the Riders 32 to 21, taking minus two on the Blue Bombers and over the 50 and a half point total. I got the Hamilton Tiger Cats upsetting the Toronto Argos 28 to 27. Give me the plus five on the Tie Cats and over the 52 point total. And I got the BC Lions in Calgary beating the Stamps 28 to 20, laying minus four and a half on the Lions and staying under the 52 and a half point total. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to watch the week seven episode of the CFL Pick Show. That's it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter. Enjoy the games in week seven. Let me know either on the Chris Jones video or in the comments down here what you think of the Chris Jones firing, what you think the Edmonton Elks do from here, what do you think their prospects are heading into this week. Enjoy the games. We'll see you again for week eight.